The Invisible Men, written by H.G. Wells, dramatic reading by Timothy Robinson, Kristen Caruso, Jeffrey Murison. This special abridged edition, all rights reserved, copyright 1981 by Audio Literature Group Limited. The Invisible Men. The stranger came early in February. Walking as it seemed from Bramblehurst Railway Station, he carried a little black bag in his thickly gloved hand. He was wrapped up from head to foot, and the brim of his soft felt hat hid every inch of his face. He staggered into the coach and horses and flung his bag down. A fire! In the name of human charity, a room and a fire! Mrs. Hall lit the fire and left him there while she went to prepare him a meal with her own hands. As she carried the cloth, plates, and glasses into the parlor and began to lay them down, she was surprised to see that her visitor still wore his hat and coat. Can I take your hat and coat, sir? I'll give him a good dry in the kitchen. He turned his head and looked at her over his shoulder. I prefer to keep them on. She noticed that he wore big blue spectacles with side lights and had a bushy side whisker over his coat collar that completely hid his cheeks and face. Very well, sir, as you like it. Your lunch is served, sir. Mrs. Hall went to the kitchen. There she filled the mustard pot and putting it with a certain stateliness upon a gold and black tea tray, carried it into the parlor. She noticed the overcoat and hat had been taken off and put over a chair in front of the fire. I suppose I may have them to dry now. Leave the hat, said her visitor in a muffled voice, and turning she saw he had raised his head and was sitting and looking at her. For a moment she stood gaping at him, too surprised to speak. All his forehead above his blue glasses was covered by a white bandage. Another covered his ears, leaving not a scrape of his face exposed. This muffled and bandaged head was so unlike what she had anticipated that for a moment she was rigid. I didn't know, sir, that... And she stopped, embarrassed. Thank you, the man said dryly, glancing from her to the door and then at her again. When Mrs. Hall went to clear away the stranger's lunch, he asked how he could have his luggage sent from the station and was quite displeased to be informed that the only way was by carrier, and it was not available until the next day. The visitor remained in the parlor until four o'clock without giving the ghost of an excuse for an intrusion. For the most part, he was quite still during that time. It would seem that he sat in the flowing darkness, perhaps dozing. The next day, the stranger's luggage arrived through the slush. The stranger, muffled with hat, coat, gloves, and wrapper, came out impatiently to meet Ferenside's cart. No sooner had Ferenside's dog caught sight of him, however, than it growled savagely and sprung straight at his hand. Those watching saw the dog's teeth bite the hand. They heard a kick, saw the dog execute a quick leap and get hold on the stranger's leg, and heard the rip of his trousers. The stranger glanced swiftly at his torn glove and then at his leg. He turned suddenly and rushed swiftly up the steps into the inn. A couple of minutes after... He rejoined the little group that had formed outside the coach and horses. Directly, the first crate was, in accordance with his directions, carried into the parlor. The stranger flung himself upon it with extraordinary eagerness and began to unpack it, scattering the straw with an utter disregard of Mrs. Hall's carpet. And from it he began to produce bottles, little fat bottles, small slender bottles, bottles of all sizes. And then... He began putting them in rows on the couch, on the mantel, on the table under the window, around the floor, on the bookshelf, everywhere. The chemist shop in Bramblehurst could not boast half so many. When Mrs. Hall took his dinner into him, he was already so absorbed in his work, pouring little drops out of the bottles into test tubes, that he did not hear her until she had swept away the bulk of the straw and put the tray on the table. Then he half turned his head, and immediately it turned away again. I wish you wouldn't come in without knocking. I knocked, but... Perhaps you did. But in my investigations, my really very urgent and necessary investigations, the slightest disturbance, 
the jar of a door. And he mumbled at her words suspiciously like curses. All the afternoon he worked with the door locked, and as Mrs. Hall testifies, for the most part, in silence. But once there was a concussion and a sound of bottles ringing together as though the table had been hit, and then the smash of a bottle flung violently down, and then a rapid pacing about the room. I can't go on! I can't go on cheated, I say. All my life it may take me. Patience indeed. Fool and liar! The stranger did not go to church, and indeed made no difference between Sunday and the irreligious days of the week, even in costume. He rarely went out by daylight, but at twilight he would go out muffled up invisibly, whether the weather was cold or not. And he chose the loneliest paths and the most overshadowed by trees and banks. It was inevitable, therefore, that a person of so remarkable an appearance should form a frequent topic of conversation. Opinion was greatly divided about his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator, going gingerly over the syllables as one who dreads pitfalls. Her visitor had had an accident, she would explain, which temporarily discolored his face and hands, and being of a sensitive disposition, he was adverse to any public notice of the fact. Out of her hearing, there was a view largely entertained that he was a criminal trying to escape from justice by wrapping himself up so as to conceal himself from the eye of the police. The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the Reverend and his wife, it occurred in the small hours of dawn, Monday, the day devoted to club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn, with a strong impression that the door of their bedroom had been opened and closed. As soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. But Mr. Bunting heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk, and then a violent sneeze. He then heard the clink of money and realized that the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold. And that sound, Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room. Surrender! He stopped, amazed. Apparently, the room was perfectly empty. I could have sworn. The candle. Who lit the candle? The drawer. And, and the money's gone. She went hastily to the doorway. Of all the extraordinary occurrences. There was a violent sneeze in the passage. They rushed out, and as they did so, the kitchen door slammed. Bring the candle! As he opened the kitchen door, he noticed through the scullery that the back door was just opening. He was certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a minute or more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. They refastened the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Now it happened that on that same day in the early hours of dawn Monday, Mr. Hall arose and went downstairs. On the landing, he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. Downstairs, he noticed that the bolts of the front door had been shot back, that the door was only latched. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot these bolts forward overnight. At the sight, he stopped, gaping, then went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again, and when still no answer, pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments and the bandages of their guest. His big slouched hat was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice outside. At that, he turned and hurried to her. Janie? "'Tis the truth that Henry said. "'He is not in his room, he ain't, "'and the front door is unbolted. "'At first, Mrs. Hall did not understand, "'and as soon as she did, "'she resolved to see the empty room herself. "'Mrs. Hall went first, 
and passed her husband in the passage and ran on. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought that he heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. Of all the curious. As she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. The chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside and laughing dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its forelegs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and <coughs> turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr. Hall's arms on the landing. They sent the maid across the street through the golden five o'clock sunshine to rouse up Mr. Sandy Waggers, the blacksmith. He was a knowing man and very resourceful. Mm, let's have the facts first, eh? Let's be sure we would be acting perfectly right in busting that there door open. And suddenly and most wonderfully, the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord. And as they looked up in amazement, they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger staring more blackly and blankly than ever with those unreasonable large blue glass eyes of his. He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. Then he entered the parlor and suddenly, swiftly, viciously slammed the door in their faces. At last Mr. Hall got up his nerve, rapped at the door, and got as far as... Excuse me? Go, Go to, to the, the devil. devil. Shut, Shut that, that door, door after you. you. So that brief interview was terminated. It was the finest of all possible Monday mornings, and down the village street stood a row of nearly a dozen booths, a shooting gallery, and on the grass by the forge were three yellow and chocolate wagons and some picturesque strangers of both sexes putting up a coconut shy. The gentlemen wore blue jerseys, the ladies' white aprons and quite fashionable hats with heavy plumes. The stranger had gone into the little parlor of the coach and horses about half past five in the morning, and there he remained until near midday. Three times he rang his bell, the third time furiously and continuously, but no one answered him. Presently there came an imperfect rumor of the burglary at the vicarage, and two and two were put together. Hall, assisted by Waggers, went off to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, and take his advice. No one ventured upstairs. About noon, the stranger suddenly opened his parlor door and stood glaring at the three or four people at the bar. Mrs. Hall, why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating? Why isn't my bill paid? That's what I want to know. I told you three days ago I was awaiting a remittance. I told you two days ago I wasn't going to await no remittances. You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit if my bill's been waiting these five days, now can you? The stranger swore briefly but vividly. And I thank you kindly, sir, if you keep your swearing to yourself here. The stranger stood looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs. Hall had the better of him. I've told you my remittance hasn't come. Remittance indeed. Still, I dare say in my pocket... You told me two days ago that you hadn't anything but a sovereign's worth of silver upon you. Well, I found some more. I wonder where you found it. That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. He stamped his foot. What do you mean? That I wonder where you found it. I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs, and I want to know how it is your room was empty and how you got in again. Them as stops in this house comes in by the doors. That's the rule of the house. And that you didn't do. And what I want to know is how you did come in. 
And what I want to know is... Suddenly, the stranger raised his gloved hands, clenched, stamped his foot and said, Stop! With such extraordinary violence that he silenced her instantly. You don't understand who I am or what I am. I'll show you, by heaven. I'll show you. The stranger removed his spectacles, and everyone in the bar gasped. He took off his hat, and with a violent gesture, tore at his wickers and bandages. For a moment, they resisted him. A flash of horrible anticipation passed through the bar. It was worse than anything. Mrs. Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw and made for the door of the bar. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, for disfigurements, tangible horrors, but nothing. For the man who stood there shouting some incoherent explanation was a solid, gesticulating figure up to the coat collar of him. And then, nothingness. No visible things at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks, and looking up the street saw the coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. Forthwith, every one all down the street began running towards the inn. And in a miraculous short space of time, a crowd of perhaps 40 people had gathered. In its struggles to see in through the open door, the crowd formed itself into a straggling wedge with the more adventurous apex nearest the end. Suddenly there was a disturbance behind the crowd. First Mr. Hall, then Mr. Bobby Jaffers, the village constable, and then Mr. Waggers. They'd come now armed with a warrant. Mr. Hall marched up the steps, marched straight to the door of the parlor and flung it open. Constable, do your duty. Jaffers marched in, Hall next, and Waggers last. They saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them with a gnawed crust of bread in one gloved hand and a chunk of cheese in the other. What, what the, the devil's devil? this? Came in a tone of angry expostulation from above the collar of the figure. You're a damned rum customer, mister. But, Ed or no Ed, the warrant says body, and duty's duty. In another woman, Javis, cutting short some statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a sounding kick on the shin that made him shout, but he kept his grip. Jaffers and the stranger swayed and staggered together, clutching and hitting. A chair stood in the way and went aside with a crash as they came down together. Get the feet! I'll surrender. It's no good. The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and as if by a miracle, the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. Then he said something about his shin and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. Abruptly, the figure sat down. The slippers, socks, and trousers were kicked off under the table. Then he sprang up again and flung off his coat. Here, yeah, stop that! Jaffers suddenly realizing what was happening. He gripped the waistcoat. It struggled, and the shirt slipped out of it and left it limp and empty in his hand. Hold him! Once he gets them things off! The shirt sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his open-armed advance and sent him backwards into Jaffers. Jaffers was struck under the jaw and, turning, caught at something. He felt a muscular chest. I got him! Jaffers, choking and reeling through the mist of them all and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy, Jaffers held tight, nevertheless, and making a play with his knee, spun round and fell heavily, his head hitting gravel. Only then did his fingers relax. Possibly the invisible man's original intention was simply to warn them off, but his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely berserk, and forthwith he set to hitting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. The invisible man amused himself for a little while while breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street lamp through the parlor window of Mrs. Gribble. It must have been him who cut the telephone wire to Atterdean, just beyond Higgins' cottage. And after that, he vanished completely. In the early evening, Dr. Kemp was sitting in his study in the Belvedere on the hill overlooking Burdock. 
It was a pleasant little room with three windows, north, west, and south, and bookshelves covered with books and scientific publications and a broad writing table, and under the north window, a microscope, glass slips, minute instruments, some cultures, and scattered bottles of regents. Dr. Kemp's solar lamp was lit. Although the sky was still bright with sunset light, and his blinds were up because there was no offensive peering outsiders to require them pulled down, Dr. Kemp was a tall and slender young man with flaxen hair and a mustache almost white, and the work he was upon would earn him, he hoped, the fellowship of the Royal Society, so highly did he think of it. His eye, presently wandering from his work, was attracted by the little figure of a man, inky black, running over the hill towards him. Another of those fools, like that ass who ran into me this morning round the corner with his invisible man a coming, sir. I can't imagine what possesses people. One might think we're in the 13th century. Asses! Dr. Kemp, swinging round on his heel and walking back to his writing table, it must have been about a half an hour after this that the front door bell rang. He had been writing slackily and with intervals of abstraction. He sat listening. He heard the servant answer the door and waited for her feet on the staircase. But she did not come. I wonder what that was. He tried to resume his work, failed, got up, went downstairs from his study to the landing, rang and called over the balcony to the housemaid as she appeared in the hall below. Was that a letter? Only a runaway ring, sir. I'm restless tonight. He went back to his study, and this time attacked his work resolutely. In a little while, he was hard at work again, and the only sounds in the room were the ticking of the clock and the subdued shrillness of his quill, hurrying in the very center of the circle of light his lampshade threw on the table. It was two o'clock before Dr. Kemp had finished his work for the night. He rose and yawned and went downstairs to bed. Dr. Kemp's scientific pursuit had made him a very observant man, and he crossed the hall to his bedroom. He noticed something and stopped, astonished. He remembered that the door of his room had been open when he came down from his study earlier, and now it was closed. He opened the door and went in. His glance, wandering inquisitively, fell on the bed. The bedclothes were depressed, as if... Someone had recently been sitting there. Then he had an odd impression that he heard a loud voice. Good heavens, Kemp! But Dr. Kemp was no believer in voices. He stood staring at the tumbled sheets. Was that really a voice? He looked about again, but noticed nothing further than the disordered bed. Then he distinctly heard a movement across the room, near the washstand. All men, however, highly educated, retain some superstitious inklings. The feeling that is called eerie came upon him. Camp? Eh? Keep your nerve. I'm an invisible man. Kemp made no answer for a space. Simply stared at the bandage. Invisible man? I'm an invisible man. I... I thought it was all a lie. But, but this is nonsense. It's some trick. He stepped forward suddenly, and his hand, extended towards the sound, met invisible fingers. He recoiled at the touch, and his color changed. Keep steady, Kemp, for God's sakes. I need help badly. Stop, please. Don't you remember me, Kemp? Griffin of University College. I have made myself invisible. I am just an ordinary man. A man you have known made invisible. Griffin? Griffin, a younger student, almost an albino. Six feet high and broad with a pink and white face and red eyes, who won the medal for chemistry. I'm, I'm confused. Uh, my brain is rioting. What has this to do with Griffin? I am Griffin. It's, it's horrible. But what devilry must happen to make a man invisible? 
It's no devilry. It's a process. Sane and intelligible enough. It's horrible. How on earth? Take it easy, Kemp. Give me some food and drink and let me sit down here. Kemp stared at the chair as it was dragged across the floor and came to rest near the bed. It creaked, and the seat was depressed a quarter of an inch or so. He rubbed his eyes and felt his neck again. Ha! <laughs> this, this beats ghosts! <laughs> That's, That's better. better. Thank, Thank heaven you're getting sensible. Or silly. Give me some whiskey. I'm near dead. The chair creaked and Kemp felt the glass drawn away from him. He let go by an effort. His instinct was all against it. It came to rest, poised twenty inches above the front edge of the seat of the chair. He stared at it in infinite perplexity. This, this is... This must be hypnotism. You must have suggested you are invisible. <laughs> Nonsense! Have you got a dressing gown? Under his breath, Kemp made some exclamation. He walked to a wardrobe and produced a robe of dingy scarlet. Uh, will, will this do? It was taken from him. It hung limp for a moment in midair, fluttered weirdly, stood full and decorous, buttoning itself, and sat down in his chair. Drawers, socks, slippers would be a comfort, and food. Kemp turned out his drawers for the articles and then went downstairs to ramsack his kitchen. He came back with some cold cutlets and bread, pulled up a night table, and placed them before his guest. Never mind knives. A cutlet hung in midair with a sound of gnawing. Invisible. I always like to get something before me before I eat. Kemp stared at the devouring dressing gown. A ray of candlelight penetrating a torn patch in the right shoulder. It made a triangle of light under the left ribs. But, but how is it done? Can't I have something to eat before I tell you all that? I'm hungry. I've been in pain. And you want me to tell stories? After he had done eating, the invisible man demanded a cigar. He then helped himself to more whiskey and soda. You haven't changed much, Kemp, these dozen years. You fair men don't. Cool and methodical after the first collapse. I must tell you, we will work together. But how was it all done? And, and how did you get like this? For God's sake, let me smoke in peace for a little while, and then I will begin to tell you. He groaned suddenly and limped forward, supporting his visible head on invisible hands. I have had no sleep for nearly three days, except for a couple of doses of an hour or so. I must sleep soon. Well, well, why not? I have my room. I have this room. The invisible man appeared to be regarding Kemp. Because of a particular objection to being caught by my fellow men, Kemp started. Fool that, that I am. am. I, I put, put the, the idea, idea into your head. head. Exhausted as the invisible man was, he refused to accept Kemp's word that his freedom should be respected. He examined the two windows of the bedroom, drew up the blinds, and opened the sashes to confirm Kemp's statement that a retreat by them would be possible. Outside, the night was very quiet and still, and the new moon was setting over the down. Finally, he expressed himself satisfied. He stood on the hearth rug, and Kemp heard the sound of a yawn. I'm sorry if I cannot tell you all that I have done tonight, but I'm worn out. It's grotesque, no doubt. It's horrible. I have made a discovery. I meant to keep it to myself. I can't. I must have a partner. And you, we can do such things. But tomorrow... Now, Kemp, I feel as though I must sleep or perish. Kemp stood in the middle of the room, staring at the headless garment. Is there anything more I can get you? 
Only bid me good night. Kemp turned aside, walked out of the room, and went to his little consulting room and lit the gas there. The morning paper lay carelessly open and thrown aside. He picked it up and opened the paper. A couple of columns confronted him. An entire village in Sussex goes mad? Good heavens! Kemp eagerly read the accounts of the events in Epping, of the previous afternoon that had already been described. He read through it again. Ran through the streets, striking right and left. Women ill with terror. Windows smashed. This extraordinary story, probably a fabrication. He dropped the paper and stared blankly in front of him. He sat down abruptly on a surgical couch. He's not only invisible, but... But he's mad, homicidal. When dawn came to mingle its power with the lamp light and cigar smoke of the dining room, Kemp was still pacing up and down, trying to grasp the incredible. He was altogether too excited to sleep. His servants, descending sleepily, discovered him and were inclined to think that too much study had worked this ill on him. He gave them extraordinary but quite explicit instructions to lay breakfast for two in the Belvedere study, and then to confine themselves to the basement and ground floor. Then he continued to pace the dining room until this morning's paper came. Kemp read every scrap of the report and sent his housemaid out to get every one of the morning's papers she could. These also he devoured. He is invisible, and it reads like rage growing to mania. The things he may do, and, and he's upstairs, free as the air. Oh, what on earth ought I to do? He went to a little untidy desk in the corner and began a note. Then he took an envelope and addressed it to Colonel Addy, Port Burdock. The invisible man awoke even as Kemp was doing this. He awoke in an evil temper, and Kemp, alert for every sound, heard his pattering feet rush suddenly across the bedroom overhead. Then a chair was flung over and the washstand tumbler smashed. Kemp hurried upstairs and rapped eagerly. What's the matter? Nothing. But confound it all, the smash. Fit of temper. Forgot the sore arm and it's sore. You're rather liable to that sort of thing. I am. Kemp walked across the room and picked up the fragments of broken glass. All the facts are out about you, all that happened in Epping. The world has become aware of its invisible citizen. But no one knows you are here. The invisible man swore. The secret is out. Well, I gather it was a secret. I don't know what your plans are, but of course I'm, I'm anxious to help you. The invisible man sat down on the bed. Before we can do anything else, I uh, must understand a little more of this invisibility of yours. Kemp sat down, after one nervous glance out of the window, with the air of a man who has talking to do. His doubts of the sanity of the entire business splashed and vanished again as he looked across to where Griffin sat at the breakfast table, a headless, handless dressing gown, wiping unseen lips on a miraculously held napkin. It's simple enough. And credible enough. No doubt to you, but uh, really... Well, yes, to me it seemed wonderful at first. No doubt. But now, great God, but we will do great things yet. I came on this stuff first at Chesilstow. Chesilstow? I went there after I left London. You know, I dropped medicine and picked up physics. Light fascinated me. Optical density. The whole subject is a network of riddles. I, I worked and thought about the matter six months before I found a general principle of pigments and refraction. <laughs> a formula, a geometrical expression involving four dimensions. It was an idea that might lead to a method by which it would be possible without changing any other property of matter except, in some instance, colors to lower the refractive index of a substance, solid or liquid, to that of air. Consider, visibility depends on the action of the visible bodies on light. Either a body absorbs light, 
for it neither reflects or refracts nor absorbs light. It cannot of itself be visible. Here's another fact you will know to be true. If a sheet of glass is smashed, Kemp, and beaten into a powder, it becomes, oh, much more visible while it is in the air. It becomes at last an opaque white powder. This is because the powdering multiplies the surface of the glass at which the refraction and reflection occur. In the sheet of glass, there are two surfaces. In the powder, the light is reflected or refracted by each grain it passes through, and very little gets right through the powder. But if the white powder glass is put into water, it forthwith vanishes. You make glass invisible by putting it into a liquid of nearly the same refractive index. Yes, yes, but a man is not powdered glass. No, he's more transparent. <laughs> Nonsense! That from a doctor? How one forgets! Have you forgotten your physics in ten years? Just think of all the things that are transparent and seem not to be so. Paper, for instance, is made up of transparent fibers, and it is white and opaque only for the same reason that a powder of glass is white and opaque. And not only paper, but bone, Kemp, flesh, Kemp, hair, Kemp, nails and nerves, Kemp, in fact, the whole fabric of a man except the red in his blood and the black pigment of his hair are all made up of transparent colorless tissue. I took up, I took up the question of pigments to fill up certain gaps. And suddenly, not by design but by accident, I made a discovery in physiology. Yes? You know, the red coloring matter of blood, it couldn't be made white colorless and remain with all the functions it has now. One could make an animal tissue transparent. One could make it invisible. All except the pigments. I could be invisible. I suddenly realized what it meant to be an albino with such knowledge. It was overwhelming. To do a thing would be to transcend magic. And I, I beheld, unclouded by doubt, a magnificent vision of all that invincibility might mean to a man. The mystery, the power, the freedom. Drawbacks, I saw none. And after three years of secrecy and exasperation, I found that to complete it was impossible. Impossible. How? Money. He turned around abruptly. I robbed an old man. <laughs> I robbed my father. The money was not his, and he shot himself. For a moment, Kent sat in silence, staring at the back of the headless figure at the window. Then he started, struck by thought, he rose, took the invisible man's arm, and turned him away from the outlook. Come, come, you're, you're tired, and, and while I sit, you, you walk about. Oh, have my chair. For a space, Rippon sat silent, and then he resumed abruptly. I had I left, left the Chiselstow Cottage already. I had taken a room in London, a large, unfurnished room in a slum near Great Portland Street. The work was going on steadily, uh, successfully drawing near to an end. And now there was scarcely a difficulty left, beyond the planning of the details. I will tell you, Kemp, sooner or later, all the complicated processes. I had two little dynamos, and these I worked with a cheap gas engine. My first experiment was with a bit of white wool fabric. It was the strangest thing in the world to see it in the flicker of the flashes soft and white, and then to watch it fade like a wreath of smoke and <laughs> vanish. I could scarcely believe I had done it. I put my hand into the emptiness, and there was the thing as solid as ever. And then came a curious experience. I heard a meow behind me, and turning, saw a lean white cat on the cistern cover outside the window. A thought came into my head. 
And you processed her? Yes, I processed her. But giving drugs to a cat is no joke. And the process failed. Failed? In two particulars. These were the claws and pigment stuff. Uh, what is it? At the back of the eye and the cat. To Tepetum. Yes, to Tepetum. It didn't go. After I'd given the stuff to bleach the blood and done certain other things to her, I gave the beast opium and put her and the pillow she was sleeping on on the apparatus. After all, the rest had faded and vanished. There remained two little ghosts of her eyes. I can't explain it. She was bandaged and clamped, of course, so I, I had her safe. But she woke while she was still misty-eyed. I can't explain it. She was bandaged and clamped, of course, like I said, but... So I had her safe. But she woke while she was still misty and... and meowed dismally. And someone came knocking. It was an old woman from downstairs who suspected me of vivisecting. I whipped out some chloroform, applied it, and answered the door. Did I hear a cat, she asked. My cat? Not here, said I, very politely. She was a little doubtful and tried to peer past me into the room. She had to be satisfied at last and went away again. But how long did it all take? How long did it take? Three or four hours. The cat, the bones and sinews and the fat were the last to go. And the tips of the colored hairs. About two, the cat began meowing about the room. I tried to hush it by talking to it and... Then I decided to turn it out. I remember the shock I had when striking a light. There was just the round eye, shining green, and nothing around them. I, I tried to catch it with an idea of putting it out the window, but it wouldn't be caught, so I at last just opened the window and left it. I suppose it went out at last. I never saw it anymore. I was tired then, so... I went to sleep, and later when I woke, there was someone rapping at the door. It was my landlord, with threats and inquiries, an old Polish Jew in a long gray and greasy slippers. I had been tormenting a cat in the night, he was sure. He insisted on knowing all about it. The laws of this country against vivisecting were very severe. He might be liable. I denied it. I tried to keep between him and the concentrating apparatus I had arranged. And that only made him more curious. What was I doing? Why, why was I always alone and secretive? Was it legal? Suddenly my temper gave way. I told him to get out. He began to protest, to jabber of his right of intrigue. In a moment I had him by the collar. Something ripped and he went spitting out into his own passage. I slammed and locked the door and sat down. Quivering. This brought matters to a crisis. I did not know what he would do, nor even what he had the power to do. I had barely 20 pounds left in the world. Vanish? <laughs> it was irresistible. With a shout, Kemp flung open the door. As it opened, there came a sound of hurrying feet and voices down the stairs. Halfway up the stairs was Colonel Addy, the recipient of Kemp's letter, the chief of the Burdock Police. Suddenly he was struck violently. By nothing. A vast weight, it seemed, leaped upon him, and he was hurtled headlong down the staircase with a grip at his throat and a knee in his groin. An invisible foot trod on his back. A ghostly patter passed downstairs and the front door of the house slammed violently. My God, the game's up. He's gone. Presently, Addy began to grasp something of the situation. He must be caught. That is certain. Yes, but, but how? The whole countryside must begin hunting and keep hunting. I tell you, Addy, he is a danger, a, a disaster. Unless he is pinned and secured, it is spiteful to think of the things that may happen. What else can we do? Bear in mind. His food shows. After eating, his food shows until it is assimilated, so that he has to hide after eating. You must keep on beating every thicket, every quiet corner, and put all weapons, 
all implements that might be weapons away. He can't carry such things for long. And powdered glass, it's, it's cruel, I know. But think of what he may do. Andy drew in the air sharply between his teeth. It's unsportsmanlike, yes, I, I, I don't know. But I'll have the powdered glass got ready. If he goes too far, we'll... The man's becoming mad, I, I tell you. I'm sure he will establish a reign of terror as I'm sure I am talking to you. Our only chance is to be ahead. The invisible man seems to have rushed out of Kemp's house in a state of blind fury. A little child playing near Kemp's gateway was violently caught up and thrown aside so that its ankle was broken. And thereafter, for some hours, the invisible man passed out of human perceptions. During that time, a growing multitude of men scattered over the countryside. In the morning, he had still been simply a legend, a terror. In the afternoon, by virtue chiefly of Kemp's dryly worded proclamation, he was presented as a villain, to be wounded, captured, or overcome, and the countryside began organizing itself rapidly. And before nightfall, too, a thrill of horror went through the whole watching nervous countryside, going from whispering mouth to whispering mouth, swift and certain over the length and breadth of the country, past the story of the murder of Mr. Wickstead. Of course, we can know nothing of the details of the encounter. It occurred on the edge of the gravel pit, and not two hundred yards from Lord Burdock's lodge gate. Everything points to a desperate struggle. The trampled ground, the numerous wounds Mr. Wickstead received, his splintered walking stick. But why the attack was made, say in a murderous frenzy, it is impossible to imagine. That afternoon, the invisible man must have learned something of the rapid use Kemp had made of his confidences. He must have found houses locked and secured. He may have loitered about railway stations and prowled about inns. And no doubt he read the proclamations and realized something of the nature of the campaign against him. In the night, he must have eaten and slept. For in the morning, he was himself again, active and powerful, angry and malignant, prepared for his last great struggle against the world. Kemp read a strange message, written in pencil on a greasy sheet of paper. You have been amazing, energetic, and clever. But what you stand to gain by it, I cannot imagine. You are against me. There is nothing for it but to start at the terror. This announces the first day of the terror. This is the day of the year, one of the new epic. The epic of the invisible man. To begin with, the rule will be easy. The first day there will be one execution for the sake of example. A man named Kemp. Help him not, my people, lest death fall upon you also. Today, Kemp is to die. After reading the letter twice, Kemp thought, It's no hoax. That's his voice and uh, he means it. He wrote a number of brief notes, one to Colonel Addy, gave them to his servant to take with explicit instructions as to a way of leaving the house. Presently, he heard the front doorbell ringing and hurried downstairs. He unbolted and unlocked the door, examined the chain, put it up, and opened cautiously without showing himself. A familiar voice hailed him. It was Addy. Your servant's been assaulted, Kent! What? Had that note of yours taken away from her! He is close about here. Let me in. Look here. He led the way into his study. He handed Addy the invisible man's letter. Addy read it and whistled softly. And you? Proposed a trap like a fool. I've sent my proposal out by a maidservant. To him. A resounding smash of glass came from upstairs. Addy had a slivery glimpse of a little revolver half out of Kemp's pocket. It's a window upstairs. There's no way of climbing up there. Not for a cat. Smash, and then a whack of boards hit hard. Confound him! That must be... Yes, yes, it's one of the bedrooms. He's going to do all the house. But he's a fool. The shutters are up, and the glass will fall outside. He'll cut his feet. You haven't a revolver? Kemp's hand reached into his pocket. He hesitated and then handed the gun to Addy. I'll bring it back. You'll be safe here. Now, for the door! His face was a little paler than usual. He hesitated for a moment, feeling more comfortable with his back against the door. 
Then he marched upright and square down the steps. He crossed the lawn and approached the gate. A little breeze rippled over the grass. Stop a bit. Paddy stopped dead and his hand tightened on the revolver. Oblige me by going back to the house. Sorry. He moistened his lips with his tongue. Suddenly an arm came around his neck, his back felt a knee, and he was falling backward. He drew clumsily, and in a moment, the revolver was wrestled from his grip. <laughs> I'd kill you now if it wasn't for the waste of a bullet. He saw the revolver in midair, six feet up, covering him. Attention! Don't try any games. Remember, I can see your face, but you can't see mine. You've got to go back to the house. He won't let me in. That's a pity. <laughs> I've got no quarrel with you. Abby's decision seemed suddenly made. He turned towards the house, walking slowly with his hand behind him. Kemp watched him, puzzled. Then things happened very quickly. Addy leaped backwards, swung around, clutched at the revolver, missed it, threw up his hands, and fell forward on his face, leaving a little puff of blue in the air. Addy writhed, raised himself on one arm, fell forward, and lay still. Then came a ringing and a knocking at the front door that grew at last tumultuous. But pursuant to Kemp's instructions, the servants had locked themselves into their rooms. This was followed by a silence. Kemp sat listening and began peering cautiously out of the three windows, one after another. Coming along the road by the villas were the housemaid and two policemen. A ringing came at the front door. It would be the policeman. He ran into the hall, put up the chain, and drew the bolts. He made the girl speak before he dropped the chain, and the three people blundered into the house in a heap, and Kemp slammed the door again. The Invisible Man! What's that smashing? He's in the kitchen, or he will be. He found an axe. A poker! He rushed to defend her. He handed the poker he had carried to the policeman and the dining room one to the other. He suddenly flung himself backwards. The axe receded into the passage and fell to a position about two feet from the ground. They could hear the invisible man breathing. Stand away, you two. I want that man, Kemp. We want you! The first policeman made a quick step forward and stabbed with his poker at the voice. The invisible man counted with the axe. The policeman's helmet crumpled like paper, and the blow sent the man spinning to the floor at the head of the kitchen stairs. The second policeman heard the dining room window open and a quick rush of feet within. His companion rolled over and sat up, with the blood running down between his eyes and ear. Where is he? I don't know, unless he slipped past you, Dr. Kemp, sir. The dining room window was wide open, and neither the housemaid or Kemp was to be seen. Mr. Helis, Dr. Kemp's nearest neighbor among the villa holders, was asleep in his summer house when the siege of Kemp's house began. He became aware of a measured concussion and the crash of glass far away in the distance. And then, as he sat open-mouthed, came a still more amazing thing. The shutters of the dining room window were flung open violently. Suddenly a man appeared, Dr. Kemp. In another moment, the window was open. Mr. Helis stood up and exclaimed vaguely and angrily at all these awesome things. He saw Kemp stand still on the sill, spring from the window and reappear almost instantaneously, running along the path in the shrubbery and stooping as he ran, like a man who evades observation. Emerging onto the hill road, Kemp naturally took the downward direction. A tram was just arriving at the hill foot. Beyond that was the police station. Was that footsteps he heard behind him? He had a transitory idea of jumping into the tram and slamming the doors. And then he resolved to go for the police station. He broke pace a little. And then he heard the swift pad of a pursuer and leaped forward again. The invisible man! Down towards the town, men and women were running, and he noticed clearly one man coming out of his shop door with a stick in his hand. Spread out! Spread out! cried someone. Kemp suddenly grasped the altered condition of the chase. He stopped and looked around, panting. He's close to here. Form a line across. Ah, shouted the voice. He was hit hard under the ear and went reeling, trying to face round toward his unseen antagonist. He just managed to keep his feet, and he struck a vain counter in the air. 
Then he was hit again under the jaw and fell headlong on the ground. He gripped the unseen elbows near the ground. Oh, I've got him! I've got him! Help! Hold! Hold! He's down! Hold his feet! Then suddenly a wild scream. Mercy! Mercy! The scream died down swiftly to a sound like choking. Get back, you fools! There was a vigorous shoving back of human forms. Suddenly an old woman, peering under the arm of those in front of her, screamed sharply. Looky there! She thrust out a wrinkled finger, and looking where she pointed, everyone saw, faint and transparent as though it was made of glass, so that the veins and arteries, bones and nerves could be distinguished. The outline of a hand, a hand limp and prone. It grew clouded and opaque even as they stared. When at last the crowd made way for Kemp to stand erect, there lay, naked and pitiful on the ground, the bruised and broken body of a young man about thirty. His hair and beard were white, not gray with age, but white with the whiteness of albinism. And his eyes were like garnets. His hands were clenched, his eyes wide open, and his expression one of anger and dismay. Someone brought a sheet from the local inn, and having covered him, they carried him into that house. So ends the story of the strange and evil experiment of the Invisible Man. And if you would learn more of him, you must go to a little inn near Port Stowe and talk to the landlord. Drink generously, and he will tell you generously of all the things that happened to him after that time, and of how the lawyers tried to do him out of the treasure found upon him. And if you want to cut off the flow of his reminiscences abruptly, you can always do so by asking if there weren't three manuscript books in the story. He admits there were and proceeds to explain that everybody thinks he has them. But bless you, he hasn't. The invisible man it was took him off to hide him when I cut and ran for Port Stowe. It's that Dr. Kemp put people on with the idea of my having them. And then he subsides into a pensive state, watches you furtively, bustles nervously with glasses, and presently leaves the bar. And on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning, oh, the year round, while he is closed to the outer world, and every night after ten, he goes into his bar parlor, bearing a glass of gin faintly tinged with water, and having placed this down, he locks the door and examines the blinds, and even looks under the table. And then, being satisfied of his solitude, he unlocks the cupboard, and a box in the cupboard and a drawer in that box and produces three volumes bound in brown leather. Presently he relaxes and leans back and blinks through his smoke across the room at things invisible to other eyes. <laughs> Full of secrets, yes. Wonderful secrets. <laughs>